Okay, welcome human biology class. This is the first lecture in the last topic in our uh, very unique class this year. Um, and we're going to be starting uh, consideration of the nervous system. Um, like other uh, systems in the body, um, we'll describe some of the uh, um, uh, aspects of it, some of the parts of it, and their function. Uh, but this one I'm uh, also intending, if uh, everything works well, to, to end it with um, a, a video that I want you to watch. Uh, a, a big part of the nervous system that I'm going to be dealing with, um, we're, we're going to talk about uh, addiction uh, at the very end, um, uh, just a bit. And so, um, yeah, that's what the, the plan is. So to start out with, um, I've got a wonderful image here, isn't it? This is one of those from Body Worlds, if you've ever gotten to see a Body Worlds. I know some of you might not want to go see Body Worlds or might think it's wrong. Um, that's fine. Um, this is uh, um, an image of the human body, um, basically the nervous system in the human body. The rest of the body has been stripped away. And what you have here um, is uh, the brain right here and the spinal cord, which comprise the central nervous system. And then you have all these nerves radiating out from it, and those comprise the peripheral nervous system. And so if you look in your notes, those two basic subdivisions uh, are among the first that I describe. Here's another look at that, at another Body Worlds image with um, uh, the nerves uh, singled out, separated out from the rest of the body. So in your textbook, um, it has uh, this diagram where it talks about the brain and the spinal cord comprising the, the, the uh, central nervous system. And then there's this peripheral nervous system. And, and it's divided up into sensory, uh, um, the sensory aspect, which uh, uh, is your body's ability to sense both its external and its internal environment and then, and then do something about that. Well, that would be the motor side. So the sensory uh, side, you see here we have the uh, somatic sensory nerves. And so skin, muscles, joints, special senses, that, that's your external environment. It's sensing your position in space, your interaction with other elements of your environment. And then this visceral, this is the internal uh, body environment. So this sensory side senses your body's internal and external environment. The motor side responds to that. The central nervous system processes information from your sensory side and decides how to respond to it, sending a message to the motor side to do something. The motor side um, has both a somatic and an autonomic side. The somatic side, um, this is, is sending signals to your, your skeletal muscles um, and uh, to, to kind of... Uh, react to what the sensory information is telling the brain. Um, maybe you're going to uh, want to uh, do something, you know, your, your, your skin has a, you have a mosquito biting you, and so um, your brain senses that, and so you tell your, your hand and forearm to swat the bug, swat the mosquito. The autonomic side um, basically uh, is, is signaling your internal environment to do something. Maybe your, um, your, your kidneys are telling your brain that you don't have enough oxygen, so your brain's going to um, go tell your, your um, 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 bone marrow to produce more red blood cells or, or whatever. So, so that's what's going on there. This is further subdivided into the, par the sympathetic and the parasympathetic division. The sympathetic is your fight or flight response. So if, if, you, if you follow the track down this way and you end up here, what's happened up here is uh, if, you're, if you're startled by something and you're either going to run away from it or fight it, then, then back here, um, then, then you're going to, your body's going to, uh, for instance, shut down um, circulation uh, to the uh, digestive tract. Um, those little sphincters that close off the capillaries or open them up will, will close off. Uh, it may uh, uh, open up capillaries wide to your sensory environment, so your eyes um, uh, take in everything, you, you're breathing deeply, your heart rate increases. Um, conversely, the parasympathetic side is the rest and digest. Um, you're calm, you're at ease, you're in your happy place. And so that's what's going on there. Okay, so that's the basic subdivisions of, of your, your nervous system. Um, if we look then at um, some images from your textbook, uh, I want to start with this one. Um, and that is uh, an image of three basic kinds of neurons. Um, now, as I mentioned uh, previously, 
we talk about nerve and neuron uh, and use those terms interchangeably somewhat. Now I'm going to, to parse them out. We're going to be um, specific about the distinction between those two. Um, just, I'll, I'll repeat this. Um, a neuron is the basic functional unit of the nervous system, okay? Uh, in the same way um, osteoblasts and osteoclasts and osteocytes were for the bone, um, then here um, we have neurons of different type, basic functional unit. Um, there are parts of the neuron, uh, this one we're going to call the axon, this long single appendage, that um, are clustered together and form nerves. And so if we look at, if I can find this picture, this one here, this would be a nerve. If you go back to this image from Body Worlds, actually I'll go to the other one here, um, each of these is a nerve. There's a, this, there's a, a bunch of axons Ah, wrong one, sorry. Uh, axons right here, uh, which we would call a single nerve fiber. That's what's a, a fiber in here. A collection of those fibers makes up a whole nerve, okay? And so this spinal, this, this nerve right here is, is what you're looking at right here. And, and this nerve is attached to a cell body uh, typically either in the central nervous system or just outside it in these little bumps right off the spinal cord. So there are, these, are, these are all long processes off of a nerve body. That'll come clear as we go. So for right now, we're talking about nerve cells, and that's what we have right here. We're going to call them neurons. That's their name, neurons. Okay, and, and they're distinct from a nerve. A nerve is a collection of axons or a collection of a part of a neuron. Okay, so if we look at um, neurons, there are four basic parts. Um, these are the three different types of neurons, but all of them have a cell body. Okay, and so there's a nucleus in there. Nucleolus has many of the same uh, organelles, all the same organelles, except uh, they don't have uh, centrioles. That means that, and you probably know this, they can't reproduce. Now, they can reproduce some of these parts of a neuron, but if you kill a neuron, it's gone, folks. Um, early in your development, your body um, was able to grow and reproduce and produce more neurons, but that stopped after an early stage in development. You have all that you're, you're going to have, and so you want to protect them. There are many things in our environment, chief among them alcohol, that kills neurons. And once you've killed one off, it's gone. But if you cut a piece off a neuron, um, it can, it doesn't always, but it can regenerate that piece. Okay, so the cell body is the first part. And then, let's see here. Um, if we look at the nuts parts, a dendrite. Now folks, somewhat, these, these labels that I'm giving to uh, the different parts of a neuron, are a little bit like trying to slam a square peg in a round hole. Um, they don't always fit perfectly. I mean, do the best that I can, but realize there's always a little more to the story. So the next part is a dendrite. You can see dendrite mentioned here. And um, a dendrite is, is basically a receptor. It's receiving a signal, and it's going to carry it um, along a direction, probably toward a cell body, and then, um, uh, then it, from there it's going to go to another part of the neuron. So I'm waffling a little bit because this, this isn't, um, uh, there aren't, there, there are exceptions to this. So in this classic motor neuron that we have here, it's easy because here we have these short dendrites. Uh, dendrology is the study of trees and, and people think these look like trees. That's, that's why they're named that. So a dendrite will carry an impulse from another nerve, uh, another neuron, I should say, or from an organ or a gland. Uh, it'll carry that to um, the body of it, and then uh, that neuron, that impulse will be transmitted down the body. It'll be transmitted from the body down an axon. That's a single long appendage that uh, connects one neuron to a muscle gland or organ that it's going to try to send a message to or receive a signal from. So you've got... Um, a, cell, a cell body, um, a dendrite, 
and an axon. And then there's kind of the uh, the important part, if you will, the more important part. It is the, the, the synapse, the synaptic knob, as it's called. And so um, at the end of that axon, so if we look at this picture right here, um, there's um, uh, a message being sent down from this cell body down this axon right here, and, it, and this axon is touching another neuron in this case. That's common in your body for one neuron to travel and contact another neuron and so on and so forth. Um, it could be also a muscle, like we talked about with muscles. It could be a gland or organ, doesn't matter. But in this case, um, this, this neuron is contacting another neuron. And that happens, so right here the, down this long axon, this axon tends to be uh, branched at the end, like you can see here. Th there are many branches here. Um, so in this particular case, uh, we're just looking at one of those branches uh, where, it cap where, it, where it contacts the next neuron in this case. And, and there we see uh, the point of communication between this neuron and this sending neuron, if you will, and this receiving neuron. And that communication occurs because neurotransmitters right here cross this cleft or this space between this axon end and this neuron body and sends the message on. And we'll talk more about how that happens, but this is, this is where the action happens, folks. This is an important part of that whole system. Okay, um, if you're looking at your notes, so we've talked about um, uh, cell bodies, three types mentioned here. We've talked about dendrites. Uh, we've talked about axons. And we've talked about the end of the axon, the synaptic knob. In this case, the uh, axon terminal is what it's called in that image there. Um, in your body, uh, you then have nerves, uh, and nerves, as I said, are bundles of axons. And they tend to only occur in the peripheral nervous system. They only occur in the peripheral nervous system. So these are all nerves. This is the central nervous system right here. This is the peripheral nervous system, and these are all nerves. So these are all um, axons coming off from neuron cell bodies somewhere in the central nervous system or in these little bumps right here just off the side of the um, spinal cord. In fact, I don't know who the tallest person in our class is, but I'm betting there's some 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 6 people in our class. Um, there's a neuron uh, in your body that's as tall as you are. It goes down to the end of your toes and it goes all the way up to your brain. Imagine a, a part of a cell that's six feet plus long. That's incredible, uh, but that's the case. So um, those nerves then, um, there are really, if we, I'm sorry, I should have not left that previous picture. If you count up, um, I'll, so if you can see these, let me zoom in on this part a bit here, and that didn't help much. But if you count, there are these uh, cranial nerves, there are cervical nerves, there are lumbar nerves. There, If you look at all the nerves that come off the spinal cord, um, you're going to see 43 nerves, 12, crani 12 cranial and 31 spinal. So 12 come right out of the skull, and there's a good picture in your, your textbook uh, of that. So here's, here's the brain, and uh, these are the 13 cranial nerves it's, it's, uh, uh, that, that come right out of, uh, out of the brain and go to the different parts of the body mentioned here. Um, yeah. Okay. And so, um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say about the basic parts of uh, neurons. Go back to this picture now, and uh, we're going to see here that we have um, the three, uh, three different types of neurons that I mentioned. And um, uh, of them, we have uh, sensory neurons, interneurons, and motor neurons. Interneurons are largely what makes up your, your central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord. But we'll start with sensory neurons since it's the first one on this list. And if you notice, this arrow is, is suggesting a, a, a pathway that goes like so. Okay, so sensory neurons um, carry a message from a sensory receptor, basically um, your, your skin, um, your eyes, your nose, your ears, your internal system, carries a message from sensory receptors to the central nervous system. So CNS refers to the central nervous system. And when you see that, you should think brain and spinal cord. 
there are 10 million uh, approximately uh, sensory neurons in your body and they are typified by a short axon and, and a long dendrite. Okay, So that's, that's very typical of sensory neurons. An interneuron, again, mostly what makes up your brain and spinal cord, um, they, they are, this is what makes up most of the neurons in your body. Most of the neurons in your body are interneurons, okay? And they're talking 20 to 200 billion of them. Again, best guess. Who, who knows exactly how many, but obviously that's a guess. And with these, they're short dendrites and variably length, variable lengths to the axons. The most classically portrayed neuron, however, is the motor neuron. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's the least common. You have about a half million of them, but, but you could argue that they're the biggest. Um, so maybe volume-wise, there's, uh, there's as much or more motor neuron, I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, motor neurons, this is the classical neuron shape, where you have um, these short dendrites right here and this long single axon. As I say in your notes, 99.9% .9 of all neurons are interneurons, and only 0.1% are these others, the, the sensory and the motor neurons. Okay? Again, sensory. The, this, these neurons are sensing your body's internal and external environment, carrying the message to interneurons in your brain and or spinal cord, which decides what to do with that information. And with that that uh, having processed that information, it will send a message to a motor neuron to do something about the information sensory neurons have delivered. Okay, so that's the bulk of your central nervous system, but as important as it is, there must be a mechanism to protect, to support, and to repair these uh, essential features, especially given the fact that um, they can't reproduce themselves except for um, appendages like axons and some dendrites. And there is. There's a whole support network and, and largely um, we're, we're looking at it right here in this image. I will put this, uh, this image actually is on uh, Moodle because it's not in your textbook. Uh, but it's a really good one and so I wanted to put it here for you. Okay, so just to um, um, sort of give you some perspective what's going on here. Um, this area right here would be considered gray matter in your brain and spinal cord. Uh, this area here would be considered white matter. We'll talk about why the difference in a second. Right here, this would be uh, a space in your, um, your uh, central nervous system. Maybe um, uh, down the center of your spinal column or the different uh, spaces called ventricles in your brain. Um, that's what we're trying to uh, identify here. Ependymal cells, among other things, um, they're going to uh, produce uh, cerebral spinal fluid. And um, that's, that's going to uh, play a big part in some, some things we'll talk about later. So anyway, let's look at these. We call these types of cells that are labeled here generally glial cells. And the first one I'm going to talk about isn't even on this image. How do you like that? It's, it's, it's closely related to oligodendrocytes right here. So um, you can see that this oligodendrocyte um, is very unique. Here's, the, here's the, the, the body, the cell body of an oligodendrocyte. There are these processes that extend off it, and they fan out to form a wrapping around uh, a neuron, uh, in this case an axon, um, sometimes a dendrite, okay? They form a protective coating around it. And folks, this is analogous to um, the plastic coating on wire. You know, if you've got current throwing, flowing through a wire, you can touch that wire if it's covered by plastic. But if you touch the bare wire, you're going to get a shock potentially. Well, that's what kind of the function of these um, uh, wrappings from uh, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells are called. That's called a myelin wrap. So, let me go to the first one in your textbook. Your textbook used to have an image like this in it, and unfortunately, they only sort of vaguely reference these now. Um, these are called Schwann cells. They are extremely important. They cover all axons in the peripheral nervous system. So, all of these structures right here, these, these axons in the peripheral nervous system, are covered by... Schwann cells. And Schwann cells, this would be the nucleus of the Schwann cell, and it, it produces this wrapping that covers the axon just like plastic covers a copper wire. And it is meant to protect and support that 
um, axon. If you cut an axon, which can commonly happen, I'll bet somebody in this class has done it, um, and uh, you, you, you might um, lose function uh, to a part of the body as a result of that. Um, the uh, Schwann cell, even though it's been cut, can provide a conduit down which that um, dendrite, or the, uh, dendrite, that neuron will produce a new axon. It'll, it'll give it a pathway, a way to grow. Without that, it'll try to reproduce the, uh, this portion of the axon that's been cut off, and it might just form a tangle or a knot here and never ever reestablish it. So these Schwann cells, not only do they protect the axon, but they also can provide a, a, a pathway uh, to regrow an axon should it be cut. Um, so they cover all axons in the peripheral nervous system. They have a, a membrane, and it's, it's pictured as blue here. Um, I wish it was white, because it's actually a very fatty substance. And this, the presence of these, this, this myelin is what makes white matter white. Um, it um, um, only covers one axon, though. And any one Schwann cell will only cover part uh, of one axon. If I go back to the other image that I have, the one that's going to be online, if you go in the central nervous system, doing the same thing are these oligodendrocytes, but notice this one's putting a wrapping around this um, axon, and, and this one is putting a wrapping around this axon. Oligodendrocytes are different from Schwann cells in that one oligodendrocyte can cover or put coverings on up to 50 uh, different axons. Uh, so they, they do it similarly, but they have a difference in that way. Another thing that I'm going to point out here on a Schwann cell, I'm going to go back to the previous image here, are these spaces between any two adjoining Schwann cells. These are called nodes, nodes of Ranvier, or Ranvier, if you are from the other side of the pond. Okay, right there. Node of Ranvier, or Ranvier. And um, impulses, rather than just go all the way down the um, axon uh, can actually jump from node to node and, and be transmitted down that neuron faster because they're able to jump than if those nodes weren't there. So remember that when we talk about nervous transmission, those nodes play an important role. Um, I'm going to just mention a couple of other things here. We talked about um, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Uh, kind of an aside, um, your textbook has a little piece on multiple sclerosis, which uh, some believe is an autoimmune disease, pretty good evidence that it is, where your body actually attacks the Schwann cell wrapping and, and sort of causes it to deteriorate. And now just like any wire, if it doesn't have that protest protective coating, it's likely to short circuit. And, and that can happen. If the, the Schwann cells are removed from um, sensory nerves, uh, the area will feel numb and we will, you will have no nervous uh, sensation there. If, if it occurs from uh, a, a motor neuron, then you'll lose function. That um, uh, part of the body, will, you'll, you won't be able to move it. And that's what uh, multiple sclerosis is. Um, a demyelination of uh, a motor neuron that causes paralysis uh, in uh, a particular part of the body. Sclerosis actually means hardened, uh, to harden. And um, um, really one of the first nerves affected, neurons affected by multiple sclerosis uh, is the optic nerve. It can cause ner uh, uh, visual uh, problems. Um, but um, there are a lot of um, hopeful uh, treatments in the offing for, for multiple sclerosis. And as you know, um, it can be um, something that comes and goes. I had a, a great aunt that had MS, and she would go through many months and be able to function normally, and then all of a sudden she would be bedridden for a month or two at a time. And, um, and it, it varies from person to person. Uh, some people are, are plagued with it all the, all the time, with symptoms all the time. Others have them only a few times in their whole life and then, then don't seem to be bothered by them. It's a highly variable issue. But this issue of loss of Schwann cells is important. Um, multiple sclerosis isn't the only issue that can cause that. Lead exposure can. Um, that's, that's why um, lead exposure, one of the reasons why lead exposure is so bad, uh, because it, um, it can cause demyelination. And if it's in a, a child in particular, as they're developing, that's particularly problematic. Um, Mercury um, uh, also is a demyelinator, and um, it's, 
was commonly used in felt pep preparation. Um, that's why uh, Alice in Wonderland has the Mad Hatter. Um, because as the Mad Hatter was making his hats, he was using mercury in the felting process to make the felt hats. It would uh, seep into his body and he um, had demyelination causing him, in the case of Alice, to act very strangely. Um, yeah, so that's one of the problems that can happen. This loss of myelin is at the heart of multiple sclerosis, very uh, nasty disease. Uh, another one I t wanted to talk about uh, related to um, the nervous system and also the respiratory system is diphtheria. Um, diphtheria is um, uh, basically uh, a, 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 an aerosol or droplet-borne or surface-borne uh, bacterium, uh, corneobacterium diphtheriae. Diphtheria means leathery because when it, it can produce these leathery coverings on the back of the throat and hard and soft palate here. Uh, man, that, had, that would have to be nasty. When you get a DPT shot, the DPT is diphtheria pertussis tetanus. Uh, pertussis is whooping cough. Uh, diphtheria uh, is a bacterial disease and um, people that don't get immunizations are, are susceptible to this. Um, the, uh, I think I don't know if your textbook was talking about um, when the Soviet Union broke up, um, their immunization program kind of fell apart and they saw a, a huge increase, hundreds of thousands of people coming down with uh, diphtheria. Okay, here's the crazy part about diphtheria. So you, you get the, 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 the uh, bacterium in you. The bacterium has to be um, infected by a virus. And when that happens, the bacteria begins to produce a neurotoxin that affects your, neuro, your nervous system, among other things. It can affect all parts of your body. But, but crazy enough, you get the bacteria in you, virus infects the bacteria, then the bacteria starts producing a neurotoxin, uh, among other toxins, and uh, affects your, your nervous system. Uh, it can affect adrenal glands, kidneys, heart, uh, and it, it is a demyelinator. So pertinent to this topic, that neurotoxin demyelinates um, Schwann cells. So, yeah, this was a huge killer. There are whole cemeteries um, uh, dedicated to just people that died from diphtheria outbreaks. This one is in Clark County, Wisconsin. Um, just, you know, horrific problems until immunizations came along and um, um, were a big, uh, I wouldn't say solved the problem. You got to have the, uh, the immunization uh, to not have diphtheria, but it was a, a big, big solution. Um, okay, last little piece here. Um, I want to go back to this one. Um, astrocytes, right here. Um, astrocytes create what's called the blood-brain barrier. Very little can get into your, your brain from the circulatory system except oxygen and sugar. And that's created by the astrocytes, which create coverings on, among other things, the circulatory system that feeds the brain and spinal cord. And that, that's a really good thing because you don't want um, things to get into the brain that would damage the brain. So you have um, um, basically a, a protection against that. So I said, what I say? I said sugar, uh, glucose, um, oxygen, and also, oh yeah, lipids. Uh, lipids are also able to cross that blood-brain barrier. Um, some medications are. That's, it's a big deal, though, uh, when you get something that will cross that blood-brain barrier created by astrocytes. So those are some of the parts, the main parts of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Uh, next time, we're going to talk a bit about how they work and uh, a little bit more about some parts, and um, we'll then go from there.